Is this sort of like just talking or whatever? Yeah, we're talking about what, race? Racism? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have conversations at work, conversations online, and where we are today in, in society, I think, you know, having dialogue is useful. I think it's, um, it's helpful when people can come and sit at a table and have a real honest dialogue. I think it's productive. We don't need to have a total agreement, but at least at the basis of it all, we can at least have some kind of mutual understanding that at least I understand you and you understand me. And thanks for seeing me. Sure. Am I right in saying you got the idea of doing this kind of, sort of as a follow-up to my video when I spoke about my thoughts on racism? Oh yeah, I mean, I know you had done a video and I, and I saw it and um, you know, people at work were talking about it. And then you and I discussed it briefly, and I think, um, you know, and then we talked about the idea of doing maybe a follow-up, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, thanks for being here. Sure. Get me out of my comfort zone of sleeping in on a Sunday. <laughs> hey, man, I got kids. There, yeah. there are no sleeping in days. Hey, someday I'll probably have more kids. I remember when my son was, was born. My ex, at the time, thought he was colic, but I was like, no. Quit. Oh, he cried a lot? Yeah, I was like, no, just quit babying him all the time. Hmm. You know, I remember putting him in his crib after I checked his diaper, fed him, held him, even sang to him. He still wanted to cry. I just turned the baby monitor down and to the point where his, <laughs> I couldn't hear it. But if he got louder to like for reals crying, it would wake me up. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. I got a four year old and a one year old, you know, crying is the order of the day, but I love them both. And, uh, you know, they're getting big and uh, they're at a point now where they can kind of play with each other. And that's fun mm -hmm. to watch, sit back and watch. I just make sure nobody gets murdered. <laughs> Wait till they start fighting each other because they're, they want mom's attention or something. Yeah, the older one is like that now. Like anytime you do something with the younger one, he jumps in front in front of the other one. It's like look at look look what I can do. Exactly. He's like, Oh, if you think walking is cool, watch these somersaults. Yeah, and I and I think, you know, going back to your con your the t the reason we're here today, like I think that's one of the main reasons why I take it so seriously. Uh things that I've 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 seen and experienced in my, my own life, you know, they were some were Trump traumatic, some were formative. Well, all of them were formative, but, you know, when you have your own kids, it get, it's like you put your heart outside yourself. Yeah. And the last thing you want to do is have your kids go through any kind of pain or trauma. And so my thing is, if I can do anything to help my kids avoid that same thing, then I want to do whatever is possible. And I think awareness and information is the best way to combat that, you know. I saw a video last night from LeVar Burton. Right. And it was back from before he was in acting and he was in college and he was, every day he, he, he did his studying late at night and it was like 1 a.m. he'd be going home and he'd stop somewhere at this place that was open to eat every day. And almost every day he got pulled over by a cop. I'm not sorry. I remember my, my parents telling me that, hey, when you get your driver's license, you gotta be concerned about police. And I lived a pretty sheltered life, I suppose, because when they told me that, I, I would feign um, attention, but I would be thinking in the back of my mind, like, that stuff doesn't really happen. That's, that was in the 50s and the 60s. And then uh, as soon as I started driving, I mean, like, I started getting pulled over, like, two, three times a month. Mm. And, I, you know, it wasn't like I was driving some flashy red car. I was driving a black Cavalier. And so, yeah, I became pretty aware pretty quickly. And that hadn't changed. That didn't really start slowing down until I was almost in my 30s. You know, way too many run ins with law enforcement and, uh, you know, and some with guns drawn. So, do you remember the first time you saw something and then had to later come with the terms that that, that, was, that what you just saw was racism? It's hard to remember what the first time was. I think, oh, uh, so I went from sixth grade to seventh grade. I, I switched from junior high, from uh, elementary school to junior high school. 
and I came out of school with uh, all A's, you know, A's and B's honor student. And I started at the Catholic school as an honor student as well. And I was so used to getting accolades for academics. And uh, they called me out of class one day and I thought it was gonna be for some accolade because that's what I was used to. And I come up the stairs and it was like three teachers standing outside my locker and they had thrown all my stuff out of my locker onto the floor and uh, accused me of stealing books. And I just started crying and the teacher was like, one of the teachers was like, well, I thought you were different. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not, you know? They started treating me like I was a behavioral problem. And then uh, my grades started to drop as well. And in the course of that seventh grade through eighth grade, every time somebody said something was stolen, they would do what they called a random locker check. And they would check my, my uh, locker and the other black kid's locker for whatever was stolen. And at the time, my, my uh, family didn't really go to church. My immediate family didn't really do much, you know, in the way of church. So I didn't really have a, a solid grasp or a hard-held belief system on who God was. And so going to this Catholic school and experiencing that kind of stuff, I just came to the conclusion, like, well, I guess this God, this Christian God, this Catholic God must be the God of white people. Mm. And uh, this must clearly must not be my God because, you know, this wouldn't be the treatment I faced if it were. The kid that I was saying, would, he would also get his locker checked. We weren't really close friends at that time, right? But then we ended up going to high school like three years later, or about two years, three years later. And we got close. He ended up exploring Islam, too, for the same reason, for the same purpose. You're like, I want to find a non, non-white non religion no i want to find the one that that is for me if this is if this is their god and this is how they behave to people who look like me obviously this one isn't mine and it was that same that same uh mindset like the i don't belong in yeah that one? i remember him telling me when we discussed it like we went out uh by this time we're in high school with jobs and stuff and so you know you got cars and you can drive so we went out and we just like you know just you know talked about it Went out to lunch and talked about it, and he was like, man, they just, that school just had me feeling like black wasn't the thing to be. You know, how that affected me in my life personally, but then at the same time, how does that affect white kids? You know what I'm saying? If they grow up and feel that way, and then they go on to be, to work in HR, and you, you're in charge of hiring and firing, what does that make you think of black people? What do you think about, and, and more importantly, which brings us to this discussion is everything that we're dealing with right now in society involving law enforcement. You know? Like, what does that mean now, a days? You know? Mm -hmm. So, what does it do for that kid that grows up in an environment where they are learned that, to, to think that black people are criminals inherently? And then I give you a badge in a uniform and I train you how to shoot a gun, how to shoot a taser, how to subdue somebody, and then put you in an environment around people you've never seen before. You know? Aside from rap videos and and news. At that point everybody looks like a criminal. Everybody looks the same to you. Well, in the example you're describing, you've got all those kids that are gonna grow up seeing this is how adults treat these my black friends, right, right, or and I don't even think it's colleagues. That or, I don't even think it's that insidious, Rob. I think, I think you just realize, okay, these people are treated differently. Your brain says, why are they treated differently? Oh, there's a negative connotation to it. Your brain tie, then ties the the person to the negative activity, whether or not it's warranted. You know, I was in a Christian school. I, I can't remember fourth grade or something. And I remember getting spanked for something. I said something obvious to the teacher. And I think it was probably the beginning of my rebellious side to, hmm. to where I was able to challenge leadership when they were wrong. And, okay. and I thought I was just helping the teacher. But the end result of this, for me anyway, is makes me challenged to challenge leadership always since then if I thought they were wrong. Because I challenged the teacher about something she said in the book. 
and I did what she asked us to do, and, and I did the homework, so I read the, the, the thing, so she said part of it wrong. She sends me to the principal, right, and I get spanked. But I have to wait in line behind a black kid, and, and he's crying because his, his mama is going to spank him again when he gets home, right? Right. And, he, and he's telling me he's in there every day, and I'm thinking back, he is leaving the classroom every day, you know? So I get my spanking, and I go back to class, and long story short, other people complain about the teacher for different reasons, and she gets suspended. So we get different substitute teachers for the rest of the year. Oh, wow. But the whole time I'm thinking about that other kid that has to go down there every single day. Well, yeah, you know? there's, a, there's a real thing called this, you know, you can do your own Google search, uh, but it's called the school to prison pipeline. Have you heard of that? Well, basically what it is is you, people target kids from an early age and say this kid's a problem. And they pile on disciplinary actions and to, to force a kid down a certain road until they end up in prison. It's not, it's not opinion. It's facts and surveys and data. You can see it. That happens with adults. Yeah, but in a lot of times in, in many communities of color, it happens in childhood. Right. I remember when I left uh, that junior high school and went to another high school, um, which was in a black uh, side of town. They ended up closing that school. Uh, in Youngstown, it was uh, South High School. They closed South High School, and then everybody else had to go to three other schools in in the city, which was Cheney, Rand, or Woodrow Wilson. My school in my neighborhood was Woodrow Wilson. I had to go to that school, which was at the time predominantly a white school school um, high school. And I remember the very literally the very first day of school. Uh, you know, you're all discombobulated and disoriented. This isn't the school you know. It was my sophomore year. I was in orientation, or not on orientation, homeroom. I'm 40, forgive me. Homeroom. And so I go up to the teacher, and I'm like, um, and I show him my, my schedule. Now, mind you, I'm in sophomore year, so I'm back as an honor student again because I had been in high school a year. I had shed all that crap from the Catholic school, and I'm back to being myself again. So I'm already coming into this school as an honor student again. And so I uh, show the teacher my schedule. And I'm like, I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to be in this class. Like, where am I supposed to be? And he was like, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, here. And he wrote a note for me. I didn't read the note. And he was like, here, go here. They'll be able to help you out. So I go to where he sent me. It's the principal's office. And the note says something to the effect about how I was a disruption to the class and recommended being, and he was recommending me being kicked out of his homeroom. This is on day one from one conversation. Now, what saved me was the fact that my mother was a teacher at that same school. And the principal and my mother were friends. And my, my the principal was like, your son is in my office for, for disruption? And so she went to the to the teacher to, to try to kick me out of his homeroom class and asked him. He, she was, he was like, well, first of all, he was late. And second of all, he was disrupting. And my mom was like, I brought him to school. And he, dro he rode with me to school. Yeah. What are you talking about? And he was like, oh, well, you know how it is. Like, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was your son. I'm just trying to, you know, weed out the bad, the bad apples or whatever. So I say that to say what, you know, I was very fortunate. I was very blessed to have family that could support me and defend me in the school with a network of people built for success at that school. Right. Right. But what about the kid who doesn't have any of that? What about the kid who's trying his best and doesn't have parents who are very active in, in their schooling? What if they have parents who are just the opposite? You're screwed. And it's unfair to typecast a student and say, this is going to be your life. But more often than, uh, than should be acceptable for anybody, regardless of where you live and what you believe, that happens far too often in communities of color. And again... So that was a long answer for... <laughs> I just asked you when the first time you saw it was. Yeah, well, junior high was one of the first times. 
that high school experience when they when I had to switch high schools was the second time uh, that I can ex- ex- explicitly remember that kind of situation happening. But it really, I think, most black men that can ha- that have experiences like this, I think more often than not, what it is is uh, when you hit puberty, you look like a threat. And when you look like a threat, you're treated like a threat. You don't realize you look like a threat. You're just like, oh, I'm taller now. I'm thinner now. My muscles are bigger now. That's cool. Girls like that. Right. But it also draws attention when you walk in stores. It also draws attention when you walk down the street. It draws attention when you drive a car. And it doesn't have any rust or dents on it. Um, I, I thought of something when I moved high schools and from Texas to Arizona. And I go into this history class. And you can tell it's all jocks. Right. And it's a little history class that's like not even 20 feet wide and 40 feet long. And everybody's already picking on me. I'm just sitting there being quiet. And, it, and the teacher says I'm a disruption. But and he, it, it's like kind of like your situation where they send me to the principal. And then my grandpa had to get involved and move me to a different class. I don't even remember what I did. I wasn't late or none of that. But when I, when I look at it from, from your story's perspective... It's like, first you grow up and you experience things. Let's say I'm a white kid and I see stuff happen to black kids. And I think that's norm- That's normalized for me. I'm right. raised on that. Right. I can either grow up to ignore it, join it, or fight against it. Right. I mean, those are the three options. Right. That's but, true. But then if I, if I were that black kid, that experience that, that I had with that class like you had in that other, in junior high, how much more often would I experience that? That's a that's a very good point. Because I, I I was raised, you know, to be intelligent and do everything I can to make sure everything happens the best way possible. Right. And for some reason, I thought helping authority, you know, in their minor mistakes, it's I didn't even feel like I was correcting them. I thought I was helping them. But right. for you, it's just it's what I look like. Hello, you're a disruption. Exactly. That's I mean that's almost. That's pretty much what happened. I mean, it was it was a little more dialogue there. And literally, it was me walking up to a teacher and said, okay, here's the person of, in authority in the room. I'm lost. <laughs> what am I, I supposed to do next? Oh, don't worry about it. I, have, I got your back. Here, principal's office, disciplinary problem, recommend removal from class. Day one, the f- the very first day, zero chance is what that guy wants you to have. Well, he didn't. Yeah, he wanted. He was weeding out the bad apples, and he saw a big black kid and said, "Hey, this is it." You know, my mom. Like if, like I said, if my mother wasn't there, who knows how that situation would have turned out? You know, how how would your education gone Correct. that way? Correct. I mean, if you're already starting out with. You mean you have disciplinary actions on your file, you do that multiple times, then that cuts off your college op- opportunities, or at least narrows them down. Uh, you're also not going to get into the honors classes, which also further narrows them down, right? Uh-huh. So, I mean, these are people who are gatekeepers. Early in your life, teachers are gatekeepers. And so, you know, these things are very real, and it's very sad. You know, I think, I. but again, it comes back down to opening channels of communication and dialogue so people can understand what's going on, what's going on. And so that people realize that, you know, just because we live in America, we pay the same taxes, we vote for the same candidates, uh, you know, we don't experience the same, we don't experience the same American uh, life. We don't have the same, a shared American experience. I, I was with a Mexican girl for five years, and she didn't have her driver's license. And I, and I, I couldn't figure that out why, you know? So I'm like, I'm going to teach her how to drive, get her around, do the things with the cones and all that stuff. Brought her to the BMV five times, and she kept telling me, this is just going to be the same story over and over and over again. She was actually planning on driving without a license because of this. Wow. She said it was racism. Okay. Because the driving, you know... The dry, they were like, no, we need to be with you in the car and make sure you pass this test, right? Mm-hmm. And they kept failing her and there was some, for something different every single time. And then she says, oh, my parents want me to drive all the way up to wherever 
it's like an hour and a half drive to their BMV because they said they got a Mexican test taker there. She passed first try. Yeah, that's very sad. So how, how how are people supposed to succeed? I, I I can't stand it when someone looks at says something to somebody with color. You didn't try hard enough, or it must have been the way you were behaving, or something like that. Well, this is the funny thing, Robert. Because in my opinion, that just means they're not observant. Because I've seen it my whole life. There's a uh, something people in our community, uh, it's a term called the black tax. Have you ever heard of that? The black tax? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that. Well, for people who don't know, basically what it means is you got to work twice as hard to get half as far. Um, perfect example, when I went to work at a daily newspaper in Lorraine, Ohio, with the Lorraine Morning Journal, and they gave me my press pass and... It wasn't really much of a pass. It was just like, okay, here's the card to get in the building. That's your press pass, right? But they also had um, the factory that printed the papers there in the same building. So they sent me out on assignments. And, you know, the Morning Journal didn't really have a lot of black reporters. They usually had one at a time for a while, which was, I mean, I'm not sure if that's the truth. But I know that's the feedback I got from the community. Like, as I would go out and I would be on an assignment... Yeah. And I might be in the black community and I'd say I was from the Morning Journal. They say, what? They got a black reporter now? That's crazy. So I say that to provide backstory to, to what I'm about to say. So I just start working at this newspaper. I uh, go to uh, one of these little suburban towns because, you know, the first thing they would do is put you on this on what's called like the police blotter and cops, uh, the cops beat. So you just go through police reports looking for worthy news. And so I would have to drive around to the different precincts and different um, suburbs to the different police departments to pick up police reports. So I get to this one police re- uh, police station, and the lady's like, "You're not a you're not a reporter. You're you're not." She then calls the Lorraine Journal in front of me and says, "Yeah, this guy, he's claiming he's a reporter for you guys, uh, and I'm not giving him anything." Oh, oh, he is? Oh, okay. So then I get, they give me, the, they give me the, the documents that I requested, which, by the way, are public information. You can go downtown and You, you don't even have to be pressed. Correct. I get back, my, my editor, editor-in-chief, he's furious, right? Furious. Like, he's like, how dare they? This is, this is bullshit. Like, and he's ranting and raving. I'm like, bro, this is Tuesday for me. <laughs> this is not, like... This is the shit you have to deal with. Um, now, so then he got, he printed up big ass press passes for everybody in the office. But, but in truth, it was for me, so people would believe me. On top of that, the, uh, um, the dress code was casual, casual. So like polos, khakis, you know, loafers, that's good enough. I would have to come in a shirt and tie every day to be taken seriously whereas my peers didn't have to do any of that you had to work twice as hard to get half as much there you go i mean and and don't get me wrong like i'm willing to do that like the world isn't fair life isn't fair that's what you have to do um but it doesn't make it i mean i don't mind talking about it because it's it's just a fact it's a fact of life america the american experience is not the same across everybody's experience everybody shares a different one and i don't mind talking about it but it's the truth you know you have to do what you have to do in order to uh you know in order to succeed and that's what i had to do i hope my viewers learn a lot from this i don't have much right now in terms of viewers but i'll keep this video up no that's fine that's fine I just, you know, even if it's just one or two people, I mean, one of the things, like I said, for me, it's really about the communication of it all. I don't even care if you don't agree with me, but at least come to the conversation and to the dialogue with an open mind. Right. You know, and like that's one of the things that that I'm trying to promote, you know, on my own um, on my own channel is just having and fostering honest, open dialogue with people from across all spectrums of, uh, of American life. I mean, there, I don't care if you're super conservative or you're, or you're an atheist or progressive, let's at least have the conversation 
so that people on the other side can listen without fear of being judged for their beliefs. And uh, hopefully we can all walk away learning something. Do you have a YouTube channel now? Um, it's called Farce the Nation. It should be up very shortly. I think our first episode should it should uh, be live tomorrow. I'll link it in the description for sure. Sounds good. It's a Zoomcast. And it, uh, is that available anywhere that podcasts can be seen? Right now it's on, on YouTube. And uh, we'll get it up and running on other uh, platforms as soon as we can. All right. So you can also hit up if you're on Facebook. You can also join the Force the Nation podcast uh, group on Facebook as well. And feel free to provide any questions or any input, any feedback, any comments that you want. We're there. Cool. That sounds pretty inviting. I know I'm going to add that probably today. All right. (laughs) All right, brother.